Hello everyone, welcome to the round table. Today we invited two experts who are ready to share their insights and analysis on global issues. We have Dr. Park Won Won, Professor of North Korean Studies at Yuhua Women's University. Welcome to the program. Thank you. We also have Dr. Kim Hanna, Professor of International Studies at Suwang University. How are you doing, Dr. Kim? I'm doing well, thank you. The year 2023 is drawing to a close with less than a week left. At year's end, just like previous years, I'm thinking, wow, time indeed <laughs> flies away. Isn't it, Professor Park? Yeah, of course. And <laughs> every year we have uh, some kind of a New Year resolution. Right, but right. this year, also December, I couldn't fulfill any of them. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You missed the chance. You yeah. missed the chance. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Kim, don't you have any uh, special habit or ritual uh, when you're greeting on New Year? Um, in Korea, I, I try to visit family, uh -huh. but um, yeah, I try to make a list of things that I'll do uh -huh. that year. And right. like Professor Park, I, I usually mm -hmm. cannot keep it all. <laughs> right, right. Same here. Yeah. Um, I usually make a resolution at the beginning of a, a New Year every year that I will stop procrastinating. Mm. <laughs> but I tend to procrastinate, so I cannot make the decision. <laughs> <laughs> Today we are presenting a year-end special edition of the round table. We'll look back on what happened this year and discuss prospects of the global affairs for the next year. The key word that can define the field of international politics in the year of 2023 must be multipolarization of the world. The United States Center international order has been shaken and China and Russia have expanded and exerted their muscles. Uh, Professor Pa, would you give us a talk about the topic that you consider one of the most important topics of the world for year 2023? Of course, I'm going to talk about this country that is directly related to the, our South Korean mm -hmm. security, that is North Korea. Of course. Today I'm going to talk about the North Korean situation this year, the 2023, and the, I will have uh, some outlook, expectation what happened in the Korean Peninsula for 2024. Let me start with the uh, so-called frontal break line. In Korean we say 정면 돌파전. North Korea has introduced this kind of new strategic policy direction in December 2019. And since then, they haven't had any change about this policy direction or line. This direction is a very clear, implement clear principles, such as, first, they are emphasizing ideological indoctrination, second, self-reliance, third, maximize nuclear capability, and finally, they are talking about this direction as long-term battle. So let me talk about this first one, about the ideological the struggle that North Korea government has emphasized for the, this year and of course start with uh, 2020. And for past three years, North Korea has introduced three very interesting laws. First is law on rejection, reactionary and ideological and culture, which it has introduced in December 2020. And second one is that introduced in 2021, that title is the Youth Education uh, Security Act. And finally, January, North Korea has introduced Pyongyang Cultural Language Protection Act. All those three laws and very clearly indicate that in the North Korea at this moment, they are not preventing any kind of a spread of the cultural infiltration. North Korea called that is bourgeois infiltration from South Korea. So for example, the last law that I just mentioned, they prohibit to use words such as oppa. Oppa means the, like a brother, elder brother, but in Korean, South Korea, we usually call, call the couple, they are called, they are, even after they married, call the husband as oppa. And North Korea is strongly influenced by this kind of a trend. So in that, this moment, North Korea used this oppa to call the, her husband. The North Korea's law clearly prohibit to this kind of calling to their husband. 
it, all this kind of indicate that North Korea has failed to prevent the spread of this, especially South Korean cultural influence to North Korea. And overall, I'm going to talk about the North Korea's the overall provocation in this year. There are several the very clear kind of characteristics that we can see first. North Korea has a very high intensity provocation against the targets of both South Korea and United States. This is pretty much different from the last year, 2022, because last year, North Korea has, has conducted many provocations, actually the highest in numbers, but most of them, they are saying that it's according to their five-year defense plan. So this does not mean that any kind of a, the specific target, but this year, Whenever North Korea has have this kind of provocation, of course, I'm talking about the missile launches, and they have said that this is a very clear target to South Korea, Japan, and even some sense the mainland of the United States. And second one is that North Korea has conducted many provocations even during the joint military exercise between South Korea and United States. This is kind of a new trend. Start with the last year. North Korea has conducted for the first time this kind of provocation during the joint military exercise. Before that, North Korea haven't had any kind of provocation during the exercise because they are kind of afraid of the very strong, powerful strategic asset of the United States. But start with the last, last year, and this year, North Korea has, doesn't care about whether South Korea, United States, or even South Korea, United States, and Japan has military exercise they conducted and they provoke during this time of period. And that's the characteristic North Korea has shown this year is that they are enhanced capability to strike the United States mainland. North Korea has focused two very important weaponry this year. One is Hwasong 18, that is ICBM solid fuel, which means that they can target it with the to United States. Second one is that they are trying to develop the spy satellite. Actually, after two times of the failure, they are finally succeeded in November this year. So this means that North Korea have satellite and also at the same time ICBM. They are trying to show their capability to hit the mainland of the United States. Then overall, it seems to us that the North Korea has uh, relentlessly developed their nuclear capability. And some people are saying that uh, it is inevitable to accept North Korea as so-called a de facto nuclear weapon state. But my argument is pretty much different. Even though it looks like North Korea has conducted many tests and nuclear and they developed their the missiles, but still North Korea has faced very serious challenges. First, Economic difficulties. North Korea said that, especially Kim Jong Un in 2021, in the Eighth Party Congress, and then Kim Jong Un himself introduced that they do have a five-year economic development plan. Their final goal is to make North Korea economy 1.4 times bigger, which means that 140 percent of the growth. For that purpose, in each year, North Korea has at least 4 percent of the economic growth. But last year, 2022, North Korea has minus 0.2, and the 2021 minus 0.1% of the negative economic growth. So I don't think North Korea can reach this kind of economic development goal. Second one is that because of North Korea's provocation, we are seeing the very enhanced security cooperation among South Korea, Japan, and the United States. And this year alone, the United States has deployed more than 10 times of their strategic asset, and also these three countries have continued to have a joint military exercise. It means that this kind of exercise can enhance the deterrence effect against North Korea. So definitely, this is a, such a bad and such a nightmare for the North Korea. And third one is their last chance to lift economic sanction for North Korea. North Korea has continued to demand to lifting of the economic sanction, but because of the North Korea's relentless development of their nuclear missiles, at the same time, the North Korea's Russia's the cooperation, there is no chance, very less chance, less likely to have chance to lifting up any kind of economic sanctions. It make, make uh, such a huge negative impact on North Korea. Finally, I'd like to have a very briefly have an expectation about the last next year, 2024. 
Of course, North Korea has continued to have a military provocation, especially they are trying to develop this Hwasong-18 to have a capability to hit the mainland of the United States. And at the same time, North Korea is waiting for the 2024 November US presidential election because this is a, such a huge event. Of course, North Korea prefers uh, Donald Trump, the former president of the United States. So overall, North Korea is going to continue this kind of provocation next year. And then they are continuing to have a so-called frontal breakthrough line. And then my expectation is the year 2025, after the November election of the United States, North Korea have chance to come to the negotiation table to be acknowledged as de facto nuclear weapon state. Of course, North Korea wanted to have a, not the denuclearization talk, rather they are wanted to talk about arms reduction talk. That's the very important point. South Korea, United States, and international community, we should prevent any kind of a dis, uh, attempt by North Korea, which means that we should not consider or acknowledge North Korea as de facto nuclear weapon state. We have to have no uh, compromise to have a, our final goal, which means that North Korea should be denuclearized. Uh, Prof. Prof, thank you so much for your eloquent presentation of North Korea's behavior in the year 2023. But I'm really curious, despite all these provocations and uh, flexing muscles, North Korea has not really gotten so much attention from the rest of the world, especially the United States, South Korea, and Japan. What happened? I think uh, there are at least two reasons that the North Korea actually failed to, to get the attention. I, North Korea definitely wanted to get the attention from the all over the world, especially from the United States. Right. First, we kind of get used to about this kind of uh, the North Korea's provocation. Mm -hmm. So I call it it's like routinization of routinization, provocation. Right. It's uh, nothing new. It's no news at all. Because I'm teaching the student and every time I'm talking about, oh, North Korea has just conducted uh, another missile test. The students are saying, you know, facing, uh, I can read what, what they thought. Uh, so what? Right. It's <laughs> nothing, new. nothing new. Nothing new. So this right. is one, uh, one of the reasons. And second one is that United States, of course, uh, with the uh, cooperation with South Korea and Japan, we are intentionally, deliberately ignore the, what the North Korea has conducted, mm -hmm. not to pay too much attention. Mm -hmm. Because already Biden administration has these kinds of experience when they are working for the Obama administration. Oh, okay. It's like a strategic ignorance, mm -hmm, yeah. which means that it's not going to give any kind of attention that North Korea had wanted. Mm -hmm. So they're not the going to whet the appetite of North Korea, right? Oh, yes, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Prof. Kim, any question? Yeah, I kind of wanted to add on to that. So recently, the political, the U.S. politics newspaper um, carried an interesting report stating that Donald Trump is considering a plan to let North Korea keep its nuclear weapons and offer its regime financial incentives to stop making new bombs if he wins another term in 2024. Uh, Professor Park, do you think this kind of deal would be possible if Trump is re-elected next year? Well, actually, I really worry about this kind of situation. Of course, then Trump uh, said that it's the fake news. Mm -hmm. uh, he has no intention yeah. to accept North Korea as a so-called de facto nuclear weapon state and uh, have tried to have arms reduction talk. But it is true that at this moment there are growing voice, not only in the Washington DC but in Korea too, mm -hmm. because the denuclearization of North Korea is unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Some of the, the American the, uh, strategists said that mm -hmm. it is uh, unrealistic. So we have mm -hmm. to accept North Korea as de facto nuclear mm -hmm. state, and then we have to prevent that actual use of the North Korea, of the, the, the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. That is so-called rational kind of a deterrence theory mm -hmm. they depend on. So, but from the, our perspective, I already mentioned in my lecture that if we accept North Korea as a de facto nuclear weapon state, it's a, such a huge security challenge. Mm -hmm. so we have to maintain this ultimate goal that is denuclearization, mm -hmm. complete denuclearization of North Korea. Mm -hmm. Now we'll be listening to Professor Kim Hanna's forecast of the new year 2024. Professor Kim, what are you going to talk about? Do you know what MZ generation stands for? Uh, vaguely, but I can assure you that I don't belong to the group. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Z generation stands for Generation Z, mm -hmm. which are, um, include those that are born in the years between 1996 and 2005. And then it also includes the millennials, who I are see. those that are born between 1981 and 1995. A lot of political leaders are striving to um, gain their votes next year. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So today I'm going to be talking about the NZ generation and the 2024 election. Specifically, I'll be discussing the phenomena of the changing attitudes of the youth, particularly during this year and the past few years, and how this will influence elections next year. This is important because next year is what has been described as election year, and there are elections being held in around 40 countries around the world. And because of the elections being held all over the world, special attention is being drawn to a particular demographic that can significantly influence the results in all of these elections, which is the youth demographic. And as I mentioned earlier, the youth are often called the MZ generation in Korea, though there are different variations of these this generation um, in different countries. And the MZ generation stands for the groups Gen Z or Generation Z and the millennials. And Gen Z usually consists of those that were born between 1996 and 2005, whereas millennials are those that are born between the years of 1981 and 1995. And the voting and political participation among MZ generation has dropped significantly in the past few years. And in addition to this, their political orientations have also changed as well. There's been lower levels of political interest and recent studies have shown there's also declining support for democracy, even in those living in older democracies. So let's discuss this in the context of three elections in particular, which are the United States, Argentina, and Taiwan. So let's start with the U.S. elections, especially because this has gotten a lot of attention recently. The U.S. elections will be taking place November 5th, 2024, with incumbent President Joe Biden running for re-election. But there are also a lot of concerns regarding uh, support for Biden in his run for re-election. In 2020, Biden received a lot of support from a young voter base. But now the voting participation of this young voter base is expected to be much lower than four years ago. And also their orientations have changed as well. According to a poll released by the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School, the percentage of young Americans between the ages of 18 and 29 years old who definitely plan to vote for president is now less than half, decreasing from 57 percent to 49 percent compared to the 2020 election cycle. In addition, even among this young voter base, those that are the youngest, those between the ages of 18 to 24, were less likely to vote than those between the ages of 25 and 29, which is the second youngest uh, age cohort. And this is a significant drop. And the U.S. Census Bureau estimates that 54% of the youth voted in 2020, which had the highest youth turnout overall in any election in the 21st century. And that's a bit concerning because even then, only half of the youth uh, decided to vote. Now, this may be very unfavorable to Biden and it may be a potential disadvantage for him because this was one of his major voting groups, but now many are also turning away from him. In fact, on his 81st birthday, Biden faced his, his lowest approval ratings of his presidency, and a large portion of this came from the younger generations. The part of the reason why a lot of the younger uh, voters decided to turn away is because there's widespread dis dissatisfaction with Biden, partly because of what is in Korea is described as a latte rhetoric, which makes him a little um, difficult at, to relate to, and it also makes him seem like one of the old guards. Many are also concerned about his health due to, to his age, since he would be about 86 years old if he completes a second term. Because of this, some have made comments about keeping him in bubble wrap until the next elections to make sure that he's safe. Also, a majority of the youth seem to disapprove of his handling of the war. 
According to a poll from NBC, 70% of voters between the ages of 18 to 34 said that they disapproved of Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war. This, conversely, will now give Trump a lead and more support from a large voter base. Similarly, in Argentina, Javier Millet won the presidency on November 19th. Millet is considered a far-right outsider and one who has a strong anti-establishment campaign, and he's often compared to former U.S. President Donald Trump. And because of this, he's dubbed the Trump of Argentina. And he's a self-described anarcho-capitalist and has a very outlandish personality. And like Trump, he has a growing support from a youth demographic. In fact, the main source of his support came from young people, and particularly young men. And he consistently led vo uh, polls of voters between the ages of 16 and 35. Even before the elections in November, um, there was a poll that took place in October that indicated that almost 50 percent of voters 29 and younger supported Malay. And his campaign started out as a youth movement. And in November, during the elections, almost 70 percent backed him. And part of this fuel behind his political rise was the devoted following among the young, largely male voters who have been described as Malaystas. And the support for Malay comes from the youth, seems to come from dissatisfaction with the economy, as well as losing more faith in political elites, which often makes elections unfavorable to more traditional politicians. Voter confidence in the presidency has also declined. And so this is, in many ways, is about rejecting the status quo and political establishment that they feel would lead to more of the same frustrations. And Malay, opposite to this, seems very anti-establishment and seems like he would bring about extreme change since he himself is an outsider. Now, the Taiwanese elections will be taking place in less than a month, with President Tsai Ing-wen of the Democratic Progressive Party leaving office since she's already consecutively served twice since 2016. And right now, it seems like a tight race, with William Lai running from the DPP, the Democratic Progressive Party, and Huo Yi from the Kuomintang, or the KEMT, and Ko wen from the third political force, the Taiwan People's Party. The TPP is focusing on the youth, and several polls show that the TPP candidate Ko is the front runner among voters aged 20 to 40. And similar to the other two elections, it seems like the biggest variable in this election is the direction of the youth voter sentiment. Young voters are in many ways similar to Argentina and the U.S. They seem frustrated with the two main political parties and view the DPP and the KMT to be more focused on the past and less on the future, which they find more important. So they turn to a third party for a fresh perspective and one that better represents their interests. So why is MZ sentiment important? Why is this younger generation, why do they have such grievances? The examples of these three elections alone show that a lot of the youth have grievances, and that's why they're turning to non-traditional leaders and non-traditional parties. And also, they are going to be more significantly influential, not just in the elections coming about next year, but in the future years to come. Thank you, Professor Kim. Well, uh, based upon your lecture, uh, attracting young voters seems to be more important than ever. Mm -hmm. um, but what kind of politician or what kind of political leaders and what causes are they especially drawn to? Mm -hmm. So uh, I know we've talked about this in the past, but the economy is always okay, the most right. important thing. I mean, a lot of young people are worried about unemployment and having stable job positions. So if political leaders can really focus on that, focus on providing better employment opportunities for a young group a young generation that is highly educated already, I think that would be the most important thing. Also, a lot of young, uh, younger people are really focused on issues that will affect them more than older generations, such as climate change. Mm -hmm. And so in, in the US, for example, young voters are very focused on um, issues related to climate change mm -hmm. to the point where they have something called climate anxiety. Yeah. Right, so uh, it, it shows that they are very concerned about these issues. But when it comes to actual uh, data, the polls show that still the economy is the most important. So if political leaders can really help the younger generations in that way, I think that would be most important.
Well, even if politicians win over the young generation and MG generation, and you are saying that they are pretty much interested in the economic and the very important trans global agenda such as climate, but still, I mean, politicians and the old generation have to keep their people's and young generation's attention, mm -hmm. and they have to bring those people into the arena of the politics. What is the best way to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, this is always, I think, a very important question. Um, and it shows that a lot of young people right now are politically disinterested. Um, and partly that's because a lot of them are dealing with um, issues related to political efficacy. And political efficacy is the idea that um, people don't feel like their voices are being heard. They don't feel like they can really make uh, or influence politics in any way. And that's why a lot of young people are voting less and less over time. So. It may sound ideal, but I think the most important thing for political leaders to do is to listen mm -hmm. to, to young voters mm -hmm. and really hear their concerns and address those concerns in a, in a clear way. Mm -hmm. And so that way, I think, then maybe traditional politics may continue to remain a bit more traditional and mm -hmm. these political outsiders may have less influence um, mm -hmm. if, if we just listen to them. <laughs> Is there any special attribute of the MZ generation that particularly you know, impresses you? I think the younger generations, the MZ generation, mm -hmm. are very, very smart. smart. And mm -hmm. they are very you know, well educated. Mm -hmm. They are very skilled, but they just don't get the attention uh -huh. um, in politics that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And so um, if we see maybe younger politicians who can understand them and relate to them, mm -hmm. that might help as well. I well, see. if I may, I just brought up the North Korean so-called market and Changman generation. They have a two very important characteristics. First, they are less likely to depend on the regime mm -hmm. because of the late 1990s so-called arduous merge. The mm -hmm. North Korea's public distribution system has been collapsed mm -hmm. and they have to rely on the economic and market. Mm -hmm. And second one is that they are pretty much open to the outside information, mm -hmm. especially the South Koreans, the so-called cave move. Many of the North Korea's young generation have experience to watch South Korean movie and mm -hmm. have the chance to hear the uh, South, South Korean song. And those two characteristics actually is a very serious challenge to North Korean regime itself. Mm -hmm. No wonder the regime is uh, pressuring the uh, population to prohibit any consumption of the outside material. So that's why I yeah, right. talk about the three important roles right. that mm -hmm. North Korea right. has passed. Right. The impure element. Right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Bao, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insight with us today. Thank you. Professor Kim, as well. Thank you. Did you enjoy our year-end special edition that looks back the year 2023 and look forward to the new year? We'll be back next year with the latest issues happening around the globe. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.